Reflections, the role of APS in promoting diversity. Uh, what I'm going to do is give you a little walk through the history of diversity within the APS. Uh, I have played a role in it, as uh, Layla suggested. I am not the originator of diversity interests within the society. As you will see as we go through the society's history, uh, we have been interested in diversity issues for many years. Uh, and we've just expanded our footprint in diversity programs since I came on board at APS. The first thing that we need to do is look at a definition of diversity. Uh, and obviously, you can read this. It's a condition having or being composed of differing elements, especially the inclusion of different types of people in a group or organization, pro organization programs intended to promote diversity in schools. APS's role is to get an inclusive society where all uh, races, genders, ethnicities feel comfortable within the family of physiology. And it's, it's something that I've tried to, to, to encourage here. I try and encourage it through my staff as well as through our leadership. Uh, but I think the society, my, like many societies, did not start uh, as a very diverse group. In 1887, when the society was founded at Columbia University, there were 17 men who attended the organizing meeting. 28 of those individuals were men, uh, and they were all considered to be charter members. Our founders were Henry Pickering Bowditch, S. Weir Mitchell, Henry Newell Martin, Russell Chittenden, and John Green Curtis. And our first APS president was Henry Pickering Bowditch. And thus, the award that was given on Monday night, the Bowditch Award, is named in his honor and is designed to, re re to recognize the efforts of a young scientist. <clears throat> the APS uh, was a lot faster than many of our sister societies in including women in the society. Uh, in 1895, just uh, eight years after the society was founded, uh, the APS received its first applicant, first female applicant, nominated, uh, as opposed to just filling out a form and submitting it. Uh, but she was rejected because of the quality of her publications. One of the early standards for physiology for APS in most biomedical, biological sciences was the quality of the publications you had when you were nominated for membership. In 1902, the second candidate was nominated, and it's important to know the name Ida Henrietta Hyde, and she was approved for membership in the society. In conjunction with the nomination of Henrietta Hyde, APS was asked to, and this was at the business meeting, APS was asked to consider specifically the question of admission of women in membership. And at the business meeting, the president was requested to cast the ballot in favor of Hyde and the inclusion of both men and women. And at that point in the society, the, at that point in time, the society served as a beacon because all that was required is you had the appropriate qualifications. And I think it's important because while Henrietta Hyde did not become an APS member until 1902, she actually published a single author paper in the first issue of the American Journal of Physiology, which was initiated in 1898. So clearly she was a research scientist in her own right, and it's really great that the society recognized that inclusion included scientists of both genders. Now, leadership has always been a problem. Uh, when I came here in 1985, uh, a good friend of mine had been the only female president of the society, and that was Bodil Schmidt Nielsen, our 48th president. We have an award named after Bodil Schmidt Nielsen, a mentoring award. Uh, she was also the first female APS council member. Since I became executive director, uh, it is not because I'm executive director, it's really because we modified the election procedure. Uh, such that the presidency became more competitive. Uh, it was a head-to-head, -head, it's a head-to-head -head competition. 
when I came on board, it was a preferential ballot where you would vote for four candidates and rank them in order, and it became difficult for a female to get elected. But since I became uh, executive director, Barbara Horwitz, our 75th, Hannah Carey, the 80th, Sue Barman, the 85th, Kim Barrett, the 86th, Patricia Molina, the 88th, Jane Reckelhoff, the 89th, and we just elected Meredith Hay as president-elect, and she will be our 92nd female president. At the same time, we've been increasing the number of female presidents. We have increased significantly the number of women who have served on council. And indeed, of the six who sit around the council table, there's usually a minimum of two uh, who are female and sitting at the table with us. Now, William Townsend Porter is a very important individual in the context of the society's diversity programs. Uh, William Townsend Porter uh, was elected to membership in 1891. Uh, he was the founder and managing editor of the American Journal of Physiology. And I think the unique thing about him, he went to Harvard. Uh, he was a professor there. And he ended up developing and building the equipment that was used in the teaching labs at Harvard University, physiology. Uh, he is a founder of Harvard Apparatus Company, a company that he offered to the American Physiological Society around 1921 because he was retiring. He wanted to give the company to the APS. Um, and the society said, no, we cannot manage that. Uh, instead, the company was sold and the funds went into a fellowship program uh, that has generated funding for a Porter Fellowship. The first Porter Fellowship was in 1921, uh, and they've continued on in some way, shape, or form ever since. However, up until 1968, 67, the Porter Fellowship was directed to majority scientists, both male and female. And from 21 to 68, 38 Porter Fellows had been selected. In 1965, A. Clifford Barger, who uh, this committee, this, the Porter Committee provides the Barger Mentoring Award, which uh, Patricia Molina received, and uh, my mind just went blank, uh, also received. But A. Clifford Barger, uh, Ed Radford, and Ed Hawthorne proposed using Porter funds to attract more blacks to physiology. It was approved by the Harvard Apparatus Company uh, and approved by the council. And our first Porter Minority Fellow, a pre-doctoral fellow, was made in 1967 to Joseph Hines. In 1970, the first postdoctoral fellowship was given to Kenneth Olden. And for those of you who know the history of the NIH, Ken Olden became the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Uh, we also provided support for the Atlantic Consortium, the group of un universities and colleges in the Atlanta area, uh, Emory, Spellman, Morehouse, Morris, Morris, Morris Brown, Clark, and Atlanta. And it was an effort to basically coordinate in endorse and improve interactions between minority and more minority schools and to get them interested in physiology. And we had the same thing with the New Orleans Consortium in Tulane, LSU, and Dillard. Uh, we also funded a number of visiting professorships. The Porter Program uh, has now supported over 140 fellows since 1967. 56% of them have been female. Uh, of the Porter Fellows, 63% have been African American, 34% Hispanic, and 2 and 1% respectively of, of American Indian and of Pacific Islanders. Now, when I looked at these numbers, I also was interested in how much uh, we had spent on the program. And we've now spent well over 4.4 million. Uh, we have 20% of our fellows 
have done their doctoral work in minority institutions. 5% of the fellows did their doctoral work at Ivy League schools. And you can see the distribution of students, the states where Porter Fellowships have conducted their research. So across most of the United States, let there be light. But let's look at the history of African American in engagement in the society, just like we did for the uh, African, uh, the females. The first black member of the APS was Joe Johnson from Howard University. Uh, he was elected in 1934. Discrimination of black members of APS was a challenge for organizing APS fall meetings. Uh, in 1949, the fall meeting was held in Augusta, Georgia. And because of the times, no black members attended the meeting. In 1952, the meeting was in New Orleans at Tulane University. And promises were made that the black members, the African-American members of the society, would be able to have access to the dorms and to the cafeterias. And lo and behold, when we got to the meeting, uh, not I personally, but when they got to the meeting, uh, they were restricted from going into the dorms and the cafeteria. And as a result, at the 1952, a letter from two of our members, Walter Booker and Joe Johnson, read, was read at the business meeting, and it resulted in a vote that for future meetings, APS would require a firm agreement from the host institution that the same facilities would be offered to all members of the society without exception. The president at that time was Eugene Landis, uh, and it was his meeting, his business meeting, at which uh, it was adopted, measures were adopted against racial segregation at the society's meeting. Since uh, the founding of the Minority Travel Program. Uh, this program was started in 1987. Uh, it was really started as a result of the fact that I wrote an application, but the application was only written because Charles Edwards, a member of the society, was working in the offices of the director of NIDDK, and he encouraged us to submit a proposal. The deputy director at the time, Pierre Renault, was interested in increasing the NIDDK footprint in minority education. In physiology, being a broad discipline, basic science dis discipline, covered almost all the programs under the umbrella of the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Disease. And so we applied for it. We got an initial $25,000, a program that we grew to about $125,000 a year. Uh, in, 19, um, in 2012, after having the program funded by NIDDK for 25 years, the director of NIH discovered that the funding was, being com was coming from a, a director's discretionary fund that he knew nothing about, uh, at which point in time it became competitive. We have gotten other NIDDK uh, minority travel fellowships or minority fellowship programs funded through NIDDK. But the APS, because of its commitment to diversity, allocated $125,000 of its own resources to continue the program which you are benefiting from today. Since 1987, uh, we have had 22,000 applications we've made 1,200 awards, or 61% of the applicants have received support to come to this meeting. Uh, we also have an undergraduate summer research fellowship, uh, a program that initially started at 12 applications because of the excitement and the number of applications. We increased it to 24, and as a result of three grants that Marsha and Marsha Mattis, my director of education programs, wrote. Uh, we received funding from both the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the NIDDK, and the National Science Foundation to expand our undergraduate summer research program to bring in minority students. And as a result, the total number of awardees we've had are 350 under the whole umbrella of the program. 
total number of underrepresented minorities uh, funded were 48 or 14 percent of the program. And I may be wrong, Marsha, please correct me. This may probably does not include the three minority federal grants that we got. This is, yeah, I think this is all, it would be, that's what I thought. And I think I do address it here. Um, the undergraduate summer research program, at least for the last five years, to give you an example, because we had the external federal funding, uh, we had 120 awardees for the UGSURF, 30 awardees for the uh, UGREF program, 23%, 11% and 3% and of the awardees. Uh, and uh, similarly for the IOSP Stride and Step Up program, that was 100% underrepresented minority. The APS also has had a summer research teachers program since 1990. It's a program designed to bring teachers into the research laboratory to help them understand how research is performed. Uh, this is just a snapshot from 2007 to 2018, but it reflects the commitment that the society has to encourage the participation of both underrepresented minority teachers or at least teachers at predominantly minority institutions. And so we've had 244 awards since 2007, 88% minority, I mean 88% 88, 88 female, 27% of the class were minorities, but 48% of the teachers taught at predominantly minority institutions. So I think when we talk about APS and its minority programs, I can say that our focus is on promoting diversity. We use creative, we create supportive environments like we have here with the mentoring and everything, with meetings and programs. We try and create targeted programs to facilitate recruitment and retention of underrepresented minorities in our discipline and career development. And we monitor your progress. We want to know when you get your degree. We want to know what you're doing in your postdoc. We want to know when you get to a faculty position. As a result of that commitment in promoting diversity, in 2003, the APS received the, in 2004, we received a 2003 award, uh, a PaysMem Award, which is a presidential award for excellence in science, math, and engineering mentoring. Uh, and we received the award because of our commitment, which is encouraging the full participation of minority students in science by providing effective programs that can be disseminated widely. widely. And on that note, I say thank you. Uh, thank you for your support of me during my 33-year tenure at uh, APS. I realize most of the people in this room weren't even born when I came here in 1985. Uh, but I am most pleased that the APS Council and Presidents have recognized the role that I've played in creating this program. Uh, and I look forward to coming back to meetings, uh, being able to participate in the orientation for the minority students, because as Marcia knows, uh, I have always been very passionate about the program. Unfortunately, the duties of being executive director have just continually increased and increased with the end result that I really don't get to know you guys very well. Uh, so I look forward to coming back and being able to get to know each of you as individuals, not as numbers, because my philosophy has always been as I want to know my, my members as individuals, not as numbers. So I look forward to answering any questions if you have them. Uh, I look forward to your successes, and I hope to hear from you in my retirement about what you're doing. I think my email address will remain the same, at least for a while, until Scott Steen, my successor, says, eh, we gotta get him off of the email server. So we'll see what happens. Thanks much.